You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So as we go about living this life through the power of the Holy Spirit, he makes us to be genuine and authentic believers. We're not hypocrites. We're authentic. We're real. We're able to be who we're supposed to be in Christ, and he's going to exhibit himself through us. So many people today are walking around pretending to be someone that they're not. They've lied to themselves, thinking that if they act the part they want to be, then eventually it will come true, or at least they'll convince other people that it's true. In today's message, Pastor Ken teaches you that when your identity is found in Christ, then there's no reason for pretense. You don't have to try and convince anyone that they're perfect. We don't have to try and convince anyone that you're perfect because you know that Christ is perfect and he's forgiven you. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Galatians chapter 5 as he continues his message, Be Careful What You Ask For. Paul outlines what the deeds of the flesh are, and we've covered it once, but let's take a look at it. He talks about sexual sin. He talks about religious sin. He talks about public sin. He talks about immoderate sin. And is there anything else that he's going to miss? It's the deeds of the flesh. That's what he's talking about. There are different words that are used in the Greek for each of these. And when he talks about immorality, the word is porneia. What do we get from that? Pornography, right? That's the word used in the Greek when it's talking about sexual immorality. And it's actually sexual immorality, the doing of it. Not the thinking, not looking at the pictures, it's actually participating in that. The next term that is used is impurity. And that word, which is akatharsia, I can't find anything in the English that that goes into. It just means the thinking about it, the moral uncleanliness. So we're talking about the doing of it, the thinking of it, and then the sensuality is a public flaunting of sexual desires. And we see that on television at 8, 8.30, 9, 9.30, and then again at 10 o'clock probably. And then definitely on the news at 11. It's constant, right? But God says those are the deeds of the flesh. That our life should not be showing that as a practice. Idolatry, in the Greek it's just idolatria. It's idolatry. (laughs) What can you say? It literally means you worship something else in place of God. God wants to be on a list of one. He's been pointing that out ever since the book of Genesis. He wants to be the only one on that list. If we put anything ahead of God, we're committing idolatry. Anything, anybody, anything. The moment we do that, we're committing idolatry. The next is sorcery. And that's really an interesting word. The word is pharmakia, which we get the word pharmacy from. To be a sorcerer in the period of time that we're talking about, you had to be experienced with the different activities involving drugs and different kinds of chemical combinations so that you could put somebody in an altered state of consciousness so that they could see the future or commune with demons. So when you talk about a sorcerer, you're talking about someone who was experienced in using drugs and mixing drugs and You know, I mean, that's why we get the word pharmacy from it, too. I mean, that's literally it. But it's drug use and occult magic practice. That's what that's talking about. Then we have enmities, which is ekstrae. That's what the word is in the Greek. It just means you're hostile towards people. I mean, that's what it is. Have you ever met anybody who's just hostile against everybody? They don't like anyone. And you wonder, what's up with that person? Well, they have a problem with enmities. They're hostile towards people. Then you have strife, heiress, and it just means that you fight for prizes. You're antagonistic. You're a talk show host, maybe. And this is not talking about sports. This is someone who's always got to be ahead, always got to be number one. They're willing to do whatever it takes to knock you down so that they can win. 
That's what it means. And then, of course, you have jealousy. Actually, the word for it is zealous or a zealot or someone who is very, very jealous. And it's just self-centered animosity. So you start putting that together, people who are hostile towards other folks, they're constantly wanting to be first, and they're jealous about anything that you get. Anything that happens good to you, they don't like it, they're jealous about it, they want it to happen to them. So then they do the next thing that shows up, which some of my grandchildren are really good at doing. It's called outbursts of anger, temper tantrums. And it's called thumoi, that's what that is. But it's just a temper tantrum is what it is. That's what it is. And do we see anybody in the public media who has temper tantrums? Yeah, all the time. And well, that leads us to the next thing, which is disputes. Disputes, it literally means putting others down to get ahead. You know, that seems to be a popular thing today. You know, make somebody else look smaller so that you can get ahead. Next, you have dissensions. That's a dispute over issues or personalities. You ever have somebody that you just can't get along with? No matter what you do, they're always finding another reason to be angry at you. They can't get along. That's a dissension. That's a dispute over an issue or a personality. Factions? That's a division over issues or personalities. And, of course, we don't see any of that today. Envying. Now, the New Testament talks about it as envying. The Old Testament called it coveting. That's where you see something that somebody else is, and you want to have it. I mean, when you look at the Ten Commandments, there's only one commandment that you can't see someone doing, and that's coveting. You can't see that I really want that Humvee parked next door. Well, I got to have it. No, I don't. I prayed about that for a long time, and the Lord never gave it to me, but it sure was a pretty car. But my wife took care of it for me. She gave me a Matchbox Humvee. And it's sitting on the counter at home, so I have my Humvee. It's great. But that's coveting, wanting to have something that belongs to somebody else. Why? Just because you want it. Drunkenness, and the word is methe. It's just excessive use of intoxicants. It doesn't have to be alcohol. It could be anything. It could be drugs. It's just drunkenness. And then, of course, komoi is carousing. And that's best translated as partying. So those are the deeds of the flesh. If a person goes through life and one of those or all of those are typical of what you see in their life, and they're telling you that they're a believer in Christ, but that's what you see as a pattern in their life, you have to wonder, what's the fruit? We're called in the scriptures to be fruit inspectors over and over and over again. That's what Christians are. We're looking at the person's fruit, what's going on in their life. One of those things, or all of those things, are the pattern of what you're seeing. Doesn't sound like the Holy Spirit's in control. Sounds like the flesh is in control. So this is how the elders Ezekiel is addressing live. What Ezekiel and what the Lord is saying to Ezekiel is, that's their characteristics. That's what they're doing. We saw some of that when we took a look at the behavior of the folks back in Jerusalem, but the ones in Babylon, or, oh, well, woe is us. We're, well, okay, fine, but you're still doing all this stuff. God wants the same for them that he wants for us. He wants us to really live. He wants them to really live. And it's only possible through him. That's the only way we can do it. Verse 4 of Ezekiel 14. Therefore, speak to them and tell them. Thus says the Lord God, any man of the house of Israel who sets up his idols in his heart. And remember, we saw that was one of the things that's a work of the flesh, idolatria, idols. Putting right before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity. So it's kind of like saying, okay, I have a problem with the NFL. So to make sure that I don't have a problem with the NFL anymore, I'm going to put pictures of various football players throughout the house, and I'm going to make sure that I have jerseys for all of them, and I'm going to have nothing but the NFL on TV all the time. Am I going to have a problem with the NFL, or am I going to get over my problem? I'm going to have a worse problem with the NFL, probably. It's become my God. It's showing up every place I am. I put it right before my eyes. That's what Ezekiel is saying. That's what the Lord's saying to Ezekiel. They put before his face the stumbling block of his iniquity. And if you do that and then come to the prophet, I, the Lord, 
will be brought to give him an answer in the matter in view of the multitude of his idols, in order to lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel who are estranged from me, who all their idols. So in other words, if you're doing this and then you come to talk to me, I'm going to call you out. That's what God's telling him. Therefore, it says, say to the house of Israel, repent and turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all your abominations. Simple. And unfortunately, we've had folks who have come in and they have something in their life that they don't want to take and put to the side and it's causing all kinds of problems and they're looking for some magic pill, some magic solution that will solve the problem in their life. Ken, what do I have to do? What do I have to do to solve this problem? What do I have to do? Repent. You know, I've only had one person out of all the people that I've talked to ever do that. The rest just put their head down and walk out. They don't want to repent. But that's what it says here. Repent. That's what God says. As New Testament believers, the moment you and I give our life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit has come inside us to live. He begins the process of cleaning out all these altars that are there. It's a long process for some of us. I mean, that doesn't happen overnight. In some cases, it takes a lot of years. And for some of us, it takes multiple applications of the rod of discipline, better known as a baseball bat between the eyes, uh, which the Lord does with me on a regular basis because I'm stubborn and he's helping me to get these things out of my life. So he helps us clean that out. We spent a lifetime putting those up and now we, we got to spend time getting rid of them. We have to replace them with the things of the Lord. He wants us to do away with the things of the flesh. He wants us to live and exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. That's what he desires for us. He doesn't want us to be phonies like these elders were, but he wants us to be genuinely authentic Christians so that when the fallen angels look down at us and they're trying to figure out where they can find a weak spot, they can't find one because we're exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit. We're not having a problem with one of these specific items of the flesh. Have you ever noticed that if you have a problem with just one of those things, it seems like you're always being tempted in that? That's because there's another group of supernatural beings known as demons and fallen angels who want us to fail. And they're looking for that weak spot in the armor that they can get in. Galatians 5.22 is where we learn what the fruit of the Spirit is. This is what God wants for us. This is what God wanted for the folks who are showing up at Ezekiel's house. The fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the number one exhibit. Exhibit number one, if you love people who shouldn't be loved, the Holy Spirit's working in your heart. Exhibited through joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You can pray for all these things as a believer. I wouldn't recommend praying for patience. God will give you opportunities to develop that. I did that once, and he gave me many opportunities to develop it. And afterwards, you're going like, "Ah, thank you, Lord, for teaching me that. I don't know if I want to pray for that again. But that's what the Holy Spirit does. He wants us to grow. He wants us to become more like Jesus. And these are things that are like Jesus. Against such things, there's no law. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. So what's the fruit of the Spirit? What is it that God wants the elders in front of Ezekiel to do? What is it that he wants us to be? These are Godward qualities that I cannot develop on my own. Can't do it. Not possible. There are other word qualities. In other words, it's it's things that I do for others that, yeah, there are people who do that because they feel good about it or they like to be videotaped and shown on television that they're doing it. But if we're doing it because of what Jesus has done in our heart, it's not something we're going to do for others to watch. We're going to do it because the Lord loves us and we love them in the Lord and we want better things for that individual. We love them and we want them to succeed or whatever it is that the Lord's leading us to do. And then we have some self-word qualities, some things that we'll see in our lives as a result of being spirit-led and spirit-filled. They're superhuman qualities. Catch that. Superhuman qualities of character that under no natural circumstances can be produced by human ability. They're divine characteristics. So fruit. 
and we see all those different terms, but fruit is actually a singular term. It's love. Love is the fruit. But it's exhibited by all these other different things that happen in a person's life. Love is the number one characteristic, and the word is agape. It's love no matter what. You love a person just because Jesus loves us. You know, it doesn't matter what they've done for you. It doesn't matter what they can do for you. It doesn't matter what color their skin is or how tall they are or how short they are or where they are in life. We love them because he loves us. That's why. It's not because they love us. We love because he loves us. I've always found it amazing, especially when I went to Bible school, to run into somebody, one of my friends who's now home with the Lord, his name was Musa Doganiero, and he was from Africa. And the first time I met him, he hugged me, which was kind of, he was tall too. And it was, I wasn't ready for that. I'm not a hugger. But he just hugged and said, praise the Lord, I love you in Jesus. And I knew I was in the right place at that point. I said, I'm not leaving here. (laughs) It was neat. Because I'd never met him before, had grown up thousands of miles away. He was in a totally different culture, yet we had one thing in common, and that was Jesus Christ. And immediately you could see the fruit of the Spirit exhibited in his life. And I was hoping and praying that he could see it exhibited in mine. That's what it's all about. Having that love, that self-sacrificing affection for others, no matter what. And how do we see that happen? Well, you have joy. It's gladness in spite of circumstances. It's an attitude. We've all had things happen in our lives that aren't really exciting things. But people are watching us and they want to know how we're going to deal with it as believers. And when we deal with something in a manner and in a way that's not typical that they would expect most people to deal with it, then they want to know a little bit more about who it is that we serve. I remember injuring my leg one time and I couldn't use it for about six months. And I had people watching me, wanting to know whether I would complain. They'd watch me fall. They want to know whether or not I was going to say anything. Didn't say a thing. And then people would start showing up in my office wanting to know a little bit more about me and a little bit more about the God I serve. People are watching. They want to know what that joy is. It's an attitude, no matter what. And it's because of the love that we have, that God's inside of us, and we're exhibiting that. And it also shows up in the world of peace. This is not where you're not fighting a war or wanting to go out and fight someone, but this is just an inner quietness in spite of the circumstances. No matter what's going on, I'm not bugged by it. That's what we have in Christ. Then the next is patience. That's just forbearance under provocation. You're just, nothing bugs you, and, well, you know, the Lord will take care of it in His time. Not mine, His. And we're willing to wait for that, whatever it is. Then we also have kindness. That's just graciousness. I mean, are we gracious to people just because we can be? Or are we just snotty all the time? Goodness. That's just always reaching out to others constructively. Helping whenever you can. Saying good morning to somebody else when they're frowning. Or you can tell that they're having a bad day. That's what that is. Faithfulness. If someone calls you and asks you to come over and you say, I'll be there in the morning. Will you? If you say you'll be there at 8, will you be there at 8? Faithfulness is your word is your bond. Whatever you say, you're going to do it. Doesn't matter. You will do it. There are times I wish I hadn't have said I would be there in the morning, but I said it, so I'm going to be there. you got to be faithful to what you've been called to do. If you've been called to a ministry and you've been called to do something specifically by the Lord, He just wants us to be faithful. He just wants us to continue to follow through with that day in, day out. And there are going to be days where you wish you weren't doing it. But that's what He's called us to do. And we just have to be faithful. Gentleness. That's just giving in to authority and consideration of others. Being gentle is not putting welcome on your back. It's just choosing to put others in front of yourself. You know, I don't have to have my way all the time. We are looking for gentleness, giving in to the authority and considering others. And of course, self-control. A fruit of the Spirit is self-mastery. It is not losing control. We've seen that over and over again where there are some folks who say a fruit of the Spirit is you lose control and you're slain in the Spirit or whatever it's called. But the Scriptures here say it's self-mastery, it's self-control. It's just that simple. 
So the observations that I have looking at this are real simple. We have one fruit, that's love. We have nine graces that it shows up in. And the words in the Greek implies that the Spirit does this in the life of the believer all at once. Now, how much of that is being exhibited in our life is contingent upon how much of Jesus that we're letting rule us. Doesn't produce one in the sake of the other. He doesn't give me gentleness and then I'm not patient. I mean, he moves me along. He keeps moving me that direction. It's called sanctification. We're becoming more and more like Jesus. And the longer that we're with the Lord, the more we become like him. But sanctification is a participatory experience. I cannot grow in Jesus unless I participate in that activity by surrendering myself to him. If I don't, I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to become more like him. The Holy Spirit, by the way, is the one who's going to be doing this in my life. I can't do it. I can't wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to show more love. Doesn't work. The Spirit is the one who's doing this in our lives. I can't do it, you can't do it, but we can participate by allowing Him to do that in our lives. If we don't participate, then we're taking a step back. We're not being more like Jesus, we're being more like me. I don't want to be like me. I don't like me. I still don't understand why Jesus died on the cross for me, because I know me and I wouldn't die on the cross for me. But Jesus loves me, and He did. I don't understand that. I'm going to ask him about that when I see him. And he's just going to hold me and just love me and I'll get it. I hope. I got a few million years to figure it out. I hope. With the Lord. But sanctification is growing and becoming more like him. That's what it is. Jesus wants to achieve this in our lives. We just have to get out of the way. That's what he wants for these folks in front of Ezekiel. He wants this. They just got to get out of the way. They did not have the Holy Spirit living in them. As believers, the Holy Spirit is individually inside each one of us to empower us and give us the capabilities to be able to do this. In Jesus, we can do it. In my flesh, I can't. It's just not possible. I cannot build this kind of character on my own. You can't build this on your own. Trust me, if you try to do it on your own, you will fail. I am a living example of that. But if you let the Lord do it, You'll succeed. He'll change you. Verse 24 of Galatians 5, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. So how do I show fruit? Galatians has that too. Chapter 2, verse 20, I've been crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. So as we go about living this life through the power of the Holy Spirit, he makes us to be genuine and authentic believers. We're not hypocrites. We're authentic. We're real. We're able to be who we're supposed to be in Christ, and he's going to exhibit himself through us. And the fruit that we produce, the fruit is simply the life we live, how we live that, what people see in us when they see us, the lives we touch, And the way that we invest ourselves for him, it has eternal consequences. Total eternal consequences. It's kind of like a simple thing. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. There's nothing against that. We all want that, but we can't produce that on our own. Only the Lord can produce that for us. You've been listening to a message from Ezekiel on the Unsafe Bible. Pastor Ken has been diving deep into this major prophet to help us all understand how to apply these messages to our lives today. Have you ever found yourself falling into the trap of sin, suffering the consequences, and then only after you realize it's too late, you offer up a prayer and ask God, why me? It's a classic case of you made your bed and now you have to sleep in it but you still ask the question as if to suggest you may not be guilty. Well, as we see here in Ezekiel, that has been one of man's greatest weaknesses throughout history. If you want to hear more, don't hesitate to contact us. You can get in touch with us by going to theunsafebible.com. 
Once there, use the Connect tab and click on Connect Card. Just fill out the form and we'll reach out to you. To listen to this message or any others from Pastor Ken, just look under the Media tab at the unsafebible.com. If you found this ministry to be a blessing to you as you've been listening, you can show us your support for the Unsafe Bible Ministry by checking out the Give tab. No gift is too big or too small and will help us continue to reach the lost with God's Word. Any other questions? Feel free to explore the unsafebible.com for more information about when and where we meet. Directions can be found on the Contact tab. We're based out of Jupiter, Florida, and want to invite you to join us in person for our next service. Until then, we want to thank you for joining us right here on the Unsafe Bible.